my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And in a recent video I did talking about how Sauron was able to retrieve his ring from the fall of Numenor, because Tolkien says in a letter that he would have had it, and yet somehow not be able to carry it off of his own dead body at the final battle of the Last Alliance after he was killed by Gilgalad and Elendil, several people made comments along the lines of, well, the Nazgul seem to be able to use their rings at a distance. Because we also know from certain things that Sauron holds the Nine Rings, and that the Nazgul themselves aren't wearing them at the time of the Lord of the Rings. And this raises several different types of questions, and I think this idea that the Nazgul are using the powers of their rings to do the things they do is actually mistaken, so I'm going to address this. And before I dive into the topic, I did want to make sure everybody is aware that I have a Discord server at this point. The link will be in the description below if you want to join and get involved in some interesting Tolkien-related conversations there with others of my fans. But that being said, let's take a look at this topic. Now, the background here is there is a statement, and I forget exactly where it is, but there's a statement to the effect that Sauron holds the Nine Rings. They're not being worn by the Nazgul actively at the time of the events of the Lord of the Rings. And this raises several questions. Are they still using the powers of their rings even though they aren't wearing them? If they aren't wearing them and Sauron has them, why isn't he handing them out to other people to create more wraiths? You know, things like this. And as far as the nature of the power of the rings themselves, we very rarely get any definitive statement about what any of the rings do. We know a lot about what the one ring does. It's kind of designed to control the other rings. The elven rings, Elrond tells us, are designed to be you know, kind of for the purpose of healing and preserving and knowledge and that sort of thing. And even his statement is a little vague. And then the rings for the dwarves and the rings for the men, we get basically no information at all, except that the dwarven rings were used to accrue greater wealth. Whether that was the purpose for which they were made is not really stated. We might be able to infer that. But there are... Also, some indications that the rings were not made specifically for any given race. So there's the idea that, you know, from the poem, three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone, nine for mortal men doomed to die. We get this idea that these rings were made specifically for the different races of Middle-earth, but that's not necessarily true. The, the half of the poem that that comes from would not have been in the original. The original thing that would have alerted all of the elves to the awareness of, you know, the One Ring being made was Sauron repeating the second half about, you know, One Ring to rule them all, One Ring to find them, and so on. That's the half that Sauron would have said. The other half, and this is a point that Corey Olson's made, I think, in Exploring the Lord of the Rings and maybe other places, but I think he's absolutely right. You can't there's no reason that first half of that poem would have been in existence prior to the forging of the first ring, by which point all the other rings had been forged. And remember, all the rings that they forged were forged by elves. These were all forged by elves, and so we. it seems a little weird to assume that they would have been made for any particular race. They weren't handed out to any other races until after Sauron captures them from Celebrimbor and then hands them out, seven to the dwarves, nine to men. Now, the reason this is all in, so important is because we don't know what the nine rings are really designed to do, but I think we can be safe in saying they were not designed to do the kinds of things that the Nazgul do which we might be tempted to attribute to the power of their rings, whether or not they're carrying them. The things that the Nazgul do really relate more to things like, you know, the terrifying people, you know, being, in the case of the Witch King at least, seemingly wielding magical powers to, you know, like destroy the gate of Minas Tirith or something like that. None of these seem to be the kinds of things that the elves would have been interested in making, so it doesn't really make any sense that 
their rings that they made would have given anybody these particular kinds of abilities? Why would the elves be making rings for men that allow them to just terrify people? That's Why would the elves do that? That doesn't make any sense. The second point here that I can pretty confidently say is another reason to not really associate what the Nazgul do with the rings that they, at least at one time, wore is, well, we already have examples in Middle-earth of, of certain creatures just causing real terror among others, and that's the dead men of Dunharrow, who, much like the ring wraiths themselves, are basically ghosts. The dead men of Dunharrow were ghosts in a different sense, of course. They actually died, and then their spirits couldn't leave Middle-earth because they had been cursed by Isildur, whereas the Nazgul never died. They just continued to live until their bodies went away, <laughs> basically. Um, so they're not ghosts in the same sense, but effectively, that's what they are. They're both not exactly incorporeal, because... Clearly, the ring wraiths have some kind of corporeality to them because they can wear clothes, they can do things like this that allow them to interact with the physical world. But they're still not, you know, flesh and blood in the way that everything else is. Mary stabs something physical when he gets the back of the knee of the Witch King, but it's not, you know, it's not really a, a human body in the normal sense of the word. So... There's something physical about them, but it's not normal, and they're kind of ghosts. And I think that is a good enough explanation for why they cause terror in basically everybody that they're around. And another point here, going back to the idea of the Witch King using sorcery to destroy the gate of, the, of Minas Tirith, the Witch King was a sorcerer quite apart from being a Nazgul. We have indications that he was, you know, he was studied in dark sorcery and whatnot from different parts of, you know, history and whatnot in Lord of the Rings and Unfinished Tales and stuff like that. We have information to suggest that his ability to do things like that is not necessarily tied to his being a Nazgul per se. We even get hints of this for... Um, the, the Mouth of Sauron. What little we know of the Mouth of Sauron indicates that he also studied sorcery. And this idea that humans could become sorcerers goes back a long way in Tolkien's writings, and it gives enough of a basis for us to say that this is not necessarily him being a Nazgul that allows him to do this. You could also surmise maybe it is because he's a Nazgul that he can do it, but it's also, just Sauron kind of importing his own power into the Witch King. And so, we get little hints around the the ending parts of the, the war that culminates at the Battle of the Polenor Fields, where Gandalf is saying that, you know, the Witch King is gaining in strength, and because his master is kind of doing things to make that happen... And so the Witch King, to the extent that he is extremely powerful at the Battle of the Polenor Fields, has something to do with Sauron kind of pumping more power into him. That connection may not have been available if he had not been a Nazgul, but that doesn't mean that being a Nazgul itself is what gives him that kind of power either. It still has to be pumped in from Sauron, so to speak. So this is why I think the whole idea that the nine rings are what give the Nazgul their abilities, their characteristics, and their powers, whatever we want to classify them as, is a little bit misguided. I don't think that's accurate at all. The other question that I mentioned earlier is, well, if Sauron has the rings, why isn't he handing them out like candy trying to create more and more wraiths and just have this huge wraith army? Well, this is a little less clear, but I think we can make a few decent guesses at it. One purely hypothetical explanation is that maybe when one person is enslaved by that ring, until they're dead, you can't use it on anybody else. I kind of don't think that's accurate. I, I really doubt it. You could assume that to get around a potential plot hole here, 
but I don't think we need to. I think a better explanation is just simply the timeline. The timeline, of course, is that at some point in the Second Age, Sauron starts handing out these rings to men to corrupt them into ring wraiths. We know from Gollum's case that unless you're using the ring on a regular basis, it's not going to turn you into a wraith very quickly. Gollum survives over 500 years, and he's still very solid and whole. Now, he's not using it very often, whereas presumably the Nazgul are using them, or you know, the men who become the Nazgul are using them somewhat more regularly than Gollum would have for whatever purposes they had, but they don't necessarily turn into wraiths instantly. That's a process that begins with their corruption and eventual survival beyond their natural span. And since we know some of the ring wraiths would have been Numenorians and thus naturally longer lived than, you know, your average human, it might have taken longer for them to become wraiths because it would have taken a while for them to progress beyond their own natural lifespan to the point where that is a natural result of wearing the ring and having that kind of immortality that not really not real immortality but the kind of immortality of just not dying so it takes a long time we don't know exactly how long but we have to remember here that Sauron doesn't gain possession of those rings until after he sacks Eregion and then after he sacks Eregion he gets beaten back by the Numenorians and can't do a whole lot for some time, and eventually gets captured and taken to Numenor itself near the end of the Second Age, and then defeated at the end of the Second Age by the, the, the last alliance of elves and men. Somewhere in there, he's got the Nine getting turned into wraiths, obviously, and that's probably all he was able to do for the Second Age. For the first half of the Third Age, he can't do much of anything at all because he has no physical form. It takes him a good while to recover the ability to reshape himself. And so he may not even really have the ability to hand out rings like that at all, because how is he going to do it? Is he going to entrust lesser minions to go carry these rings and give them to people? That doesn't seem like something Sauron would do. Sauron's probably doing the whole Anatar thing and handing them out to other people, you know, trying to give them rings on the sly, like, hey, would you like this, and doing it himself. Of course, this runs into a problem, because after Numenor, he can't do the Anatar thing, because Anatar is a nice-looking guy, and he can't be nice-looking after the fall of Numenor. He's stuck in a evil, dark-looking body, and therefore can't be quite as sly about it. So if he was going to do it, he might have to do it through intermediaries, whom he might not trust. But even if he wanted to do it himself, he still has the problem of, he has to start way later in the Third Age because he's starting with a body way later in the Third Age. And so by the time we get to the end of it, do we even know that he has really any time to get a new set of ring rights going? We don't know if he ever has the capability of really carrying through that plan in time to have more ring rates than the Nine running around. By the time we get to the Lord of the Rings, he hasn't had a body for that long. He was, of course, the necromancer for a while and probably had a physical body for some of that time. But it's not clear when that happened. Because for most of it, the necromancer was not somebody that anybody really had visual eyes on. I mean, like <laughs> nobody's up there just chatting with the necromancer, seeing his, you know, he was staying hidden on purpose. So we don't even know how long he had a physical body. We don't know where the Nine were even kept. It might have been buried in the rubble of the original Baradur, in which case he had to uncover them in the rubble, which happened much later in the Third Age. So when is he even going to have time to get them out there? It could be that by the time of the Lord of the Rings, there were Nine Rings floating around out there being worn by other people, but again, it's going to take a good while for those rings to have the effect of turning the, their bearers into ring wraiths. Therefore, it could be that there were people wearing them at the time, but they weren't Nazgul yet. So, I think just on the timeline by itself, we have pretty good reason to think that Sauron just probably wouldn't have even had the opportunity at that stage to have created more ring rates, even if it were possible. 
Again, we don't know that it was possible because, like I said, you can imagine hypotheticals like you can't create more once you've got some people tied to a ring already. So you could imagine that. I don't think we have to, and I don't think there's really any support for the idea. But even if there was, this would explain it one way or the other. So that's my explanation for why the nine rings don't seem to have been spread out, you know, creating just armies and armies of ring race. It takes time, and Sauron didn't have it. So those are just some of the ideas that I wanted to go over in terms of the nine rings, how they operate, and what role they're really playing in this vast sweep of history behind the Lord of the Rings that kind of got raised by all these comments in my previous video, which I will link to in the description below, of course. If you did enjoy the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it around. If you want to catch all my content, make sure you subscribe. I'm on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey. You can also catch podcast versions of these as well. You can follow me on Twitter at JRRT Lore, and you can support me at Patreon. And don't forget that Discord server if you're interested. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. Namadaye. Thanks to all my Patreon patrons, especially Ringbearer Ego Voice and Elf Friends PA Brew News, Deanna Kaufman, Tracy Meehan, and Nathan Dufour.